Mm -hmm. Ready. Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Eh, estamos de nuevo en el ciclo de conferencias de la licenciatura en ecología eh, de la Escuela Nacional de Estudios Superiores Unidad Morelia en Morelia de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Eh, muchísimas gracias a toda la audiencia por estar acá presente. Eh, hoy tenemos el gran placer de presentar a ustedes eh, al doctor Hervé Soque eh, del Royal Botanic Gardens and the Main Trust de Sydney, Australia y de la Universidad de eh, New South Wales en Sydney, Australia. Eh, el doctor eh, Soque es un investigador en eh, la evolución de angiospermas eh, y eh, eh, le agradecemos muchísimo su presencia y el aceptar nuestra invitación eh, y hoy nos va a hablar acerca de eh, los retos y preguntas eh, para la reconstrucción eh, de flores ancestrales de angiospermas. Eh, realmente nos da muchísimo gusto que esté aquí presente. Eh, uh, thank you, Hervé, uh, for, for being here. Uh, we really would like to, to thank you for, for, for accepting our invitation. And, and now Silvana will introduce you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Buenas tardes. <laughs> Buenas tardes, eh, jóvenes, estudiantes, colegas. Eh, tanto de nuestra audiencia de la licenciatura en ecología como de otras entidades de la UNAM, eh, instituciones, eh, otras instituciones de México y también queremos eh, dar la bienvenida a nuestra audiencia internacional. Eh, posiblemente tengamos también alguna audiencia eh, de Australia. So, good morning to those Australians who are listening to us at this time. Eh, bueno, el doctor Soque, eh, como bien lo dijo Mauricio, trabaja en los jardines botánicos de Sydney, Australia, a donde actualmente es investigador eh, de, eh, consolidado de estos jardines botánicos. Eh, realizó sus estudios de doctorado en la Universidad eh, Pierre et Marie Curie en Francia, en París, que actualmente es parte de la Sorbona Paris Sales. Sí, sí, bien entiendo. Eh, también realizó un postdoctorado en el Jardín Botánico de Estocolmo, en Suecia. Y bueno, es, un, es, bio, es botánico, es biólogo evolutivo y como dijo Mauricio, sus principales líneas de, de investigación se centran en diversos aspectos de la macroevolución de las angiospermas y de la evolución floral en diferentes sistemas. Eh, para esto utiliza diferentes enfoques en la sistemática, de sistemática filogenética y comparativa, secuenciación de nueva generación, biología del desarrollo, eh, morfología de flores, de polen y paleobiología también. Tiene más de 50 publicaciones en revistas arbitradas, ar capítulos de libro, eh, Así es que es un investigador de gran calibre que además no es ajeno a México. Tiene diversas colaboraciones con investigadores mexicanos, una de las más fuertes con la doctora Susana Magallón del Instituto de Biología eh, y algunos otros investigadores. Y a partir de estas colaboraciones, si ustedes eh, revisan el currículum y las publicaciones del doctor Soque, verán que hay eh, pues grandes contribuciones ¿no? al campo de la evolución de las angiospermas eh, en, en revistas importantes eh, de plantas y de evolución. Estamos muy agradecidos con Hervé por, por haber particip decidido participar en nuestro seminario eh, y particularmente a las tempranas horas de la mañana eh, en Australia, en Sydney, actualmente son las 8 de la mañana, entonces, muchas gracias. Eh, y bueno, también, bueno, gracias a toda la audiencia y pues ya los dejo para que disfrutemos de la plática de, del doctor Soto. Adelante. 
Um, thank you so much for the lovely introductions. Um, thank you so much also for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be giving this talk to all of you today. Um, I should mention before I start that I told the organizers that it would be wonderful if you uh, wanted to interrupt me during the talk. Uh, it's not a very long talk, so I will take my time. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the chat. And the organizers uh, might ask these questions to me halfway or in the beginning of the talk. Uh, that might make it more interactive for, for all of us. So please don't hesitate. Don't hesitate to ask these questions in, in Spanish or Portuguese as well. Uh, we can then, um, uh, I, I can read those languages, so it should be fine. All right, so um, the talk that I'm giving today is, uh, is a rather broad talk on a particular topic that I'm really interested in is the uh, floral evolution in, in angiosperms. And it's based on work that uh, I will refer to many times that was published three years ago, but it's a sort of um, uh, thinking three years later, uh, how do we think about the results we published and how did we get there? So it will be a bit more of a, um, um, let's say a mature perspective on, on work that we published a, a while back. Um, and it's work done in collaboration with many co-authors and I'll mention many of them. And there are several that are actually in Mexico as uh, Silvana mentioned. All right, so let's start. Um, so what I'm really passionate about uh, is uh, the extraordinary diversity of flowers in flowering plants. I should mention this picture is actually assembled by uh, our colleague Santiago Ramirez Barahona. Uh, for recent work that we did together. And if, if we posted a picture like this about leaves or roots, or, um, it wouldn't be as spectacular. So uh, we're, we're all fascinated by that for, for many centuries that floral diversity has been the key to identifying plants. And basically um, the general um, idea that's never really been fully tested is that it probably has something to do with the extraordinary diversity of species, the, 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 spe the incredible species richness of flowering plants themselves. And so all of my work is trying to understand what is the link between um, this extraordinary uh, story of diversification of floral shapes in flowering plants uh, since their origin and the diversity of flowering plants that we see today. I don't think will ever uh, answer that question entirely, but we can try. And this is what I'm trying to do through my work. Um, in the <clears throat> first part of my talk, I will mostly focus on one particular question, which is probably also the question that is most difficult to answer. And it's looking back at the very first flower, or let's say the flower of the most recent common ancestor of all flowering plants. What might have it looked like? And this is an important question because it will tell us something about where flowers came from uh, uh, within land plants and also why uh, flowering plants suddenly appeared and what was so important for them uh, to diversify so quickly. So I should specify that this answer, this question has been asked for a very long time. In fact, uh, back in 1907, more than a hundred years ago, there were two competing theories uh, one that uh, is summarized by the first row uh, of pictures here is that it was a rather uh, complex flower with many parts, um, uh, such as we see today in, in the magnolia, many tepals, many stamens, many carpels, uh, but we see also in other, in other flowering plants. And this, um, this was argued on, on, on various grounds, but in particular, the fossil record was important uh, in recognizing uh, that these may have been um, uh, close to what the ancestral flower looked like. I should mention at this stage, um, we would never ever again uh, look among living members of a clade uh, for identical pictures of what they look like uh, 200 million years ago, 150 million years ago. But these comparisons have been made over and over. So it's important to take from a historical point of view that uh, magnolias and their relatives have been proposed as primitive by many people uh, in previous times. 
And these were also superficially looking like uh, an important group in the fossil record called the Benedictalis. And you see a reconstruction here. Uh, these are the flowers. And they, they do have reproductive, bisexual reproductive structures that in many respects uh, look like uh, uh, modern flowers. And so um, this comparison was made. However, uh, nowadays, no one uh, thinks of Benedictalis as actually having flowers. People think of them more as having uh, independently uh, evolved uh, reproductive structures that do look like flowers. But at the same time, there was a competing theory that in, instead um, the early flowers were very simple uh, and perhaps unisexual. Uh, and and I've put a few examples here. The one on the left hand side is um, a picture that I took in my former university in uh, Université Paris uh, Sud in Orsay, uh, near in suburbs of Paris. And there is a lot of temperate trees around there. And most of the temperate trees that we have in Europe have uh, very simple flowers, uh, such as in the species here of uh, beech. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, there was also even uh, more uh, extreme examples of simple flowers, such as the flowers of uh, Chlorantaceae. So in, in Chlorantaceae, it's a very unique family. In three of the four genera, uh, the flowers are as simple as you can get. There's absolutely no perianth, and the flower is either one carpel or one or perhaps uh, one and a half stamen. So it, you can't be more simple as that for a flower. And this was uh, the Chlorantaceae were put back uh, to the forefront of these theories when uh, their fossil pollen was found as one of the earliest fossil pollen ever found for flowering plants. At the same time, in uh, about 20 years ago, uh, fossils were also found. Some of the earliest fossils of flowering plants were found uh, uh, as aquatic fossils with uh, very simple um, inflorescences such as Archifractus. And this also put back uh, on the table the idea that, well, in fact, the, the, the earliest flowers may have been very simple. So at the end, we actually didn't know. And we, well, we'll, we'll see what we now know. But these two, these two, these two theories have competed for, for a really long time. However, uh, nowadays, we are in a completely different setting. We have a really uh, thorough understanding of phylogenetic relationships in flowering plants. So this is a very simplified tree uh, that shows the main lineages of flowering plants. And as you might know, most of the species diversity is in these two major clades, eudacots and monocots. Uh, that's about 95% of all of the species of flowering plants. Uh, but since 1999, we know with quite good confidence, and this has been uh, confirmed many, many times, that the earliest diverging lineages of flowering plants are uh, first uh, the species Amborella uh, trichopoda from New Caledonia, then uh, the order uh, Nymphialis, the water lilies, and then uh, a very strange order called Astrobelialis. And I've, I've put you here an example. It's actually a, a very strange species. Um, so Astrobelialis includes, I'm not exactly sure, but about a hundred species. Um, but many of them are in the Southern hemisphere. And in particular, it's named after Astrobelia scandens. And this is a vine from the Northern tropics in Australia. It's a very weird flower. It stinks, it attracts uh, carrion flies for pollination. Uh, and it's, you really don't wanna smell that flower. So if so someone, one of you ever comes to the Botanic Gardens in Sydney, uh, let me know and I'll show you because that blooms in our, in our garden. Um, and why am I showing you this picture? Because um, although we have a very thorough understanding of the phylogeny of flowering plants, um, this is not enough to understand what the earliest flowers look like. Uh, we would never uh, anymore think that because Amborellaceae, oops, Amborella is the sister group of all flowering of uh, all remaining flowering plants. That means that this is a portrait of the ancestor of flowering plants. Um, this is not a good way to read a phylogeny. In fact, there's a lot of time. There's there's an extreme amount of time from the origin of flowering plants to Amborella uh, for evolution to, to have occurred. So we should be very careful in drawing any conclusions about what Amborella is compared to the origin of flowering plants. And to show you a few, uh, few characters, the flowers are entirely spiral. And uh, more importantly, they're unisexual. So we have female flowers on the left-hand side and male flowers uh, here. And they're just, the sexes are separate. So that 
didn't help in solving the question about whether the ancestral flower was bisexual or unisexual. Uh, because of that situation, it made uh, reconstructions very uncertain at the base of the ang angiosperms. Uh, so I, I mentioned that the arrangement of parts was spiral, but in the next lineage, in Nymphialis, it's actually whorled. Um, many people think of water lilies as spiral, but it's not true. And you see it really well in that picture. You see various whorls of four parts. The next one, however, Astrobelia is a spiral again. So that makes a very complicated mix, uh, a combination of characters at the base of angiosperms that made that has made reconstructions uh, very ambiguous for a long time. And I'll show you one example here. Uh, it's it's truly groundbreaking work by two of our colleagues. Uh, so on the left hand side, uh, Jim Doyle, who works at the University of California in Davis, and on the right hand side, Peter Andres uh, from uh, the Institute of Systematic Botany in Zurich at the University of Zurich. And together, uh, for a very long time, they have put together morphological matrices of uh, so-called basal angiosperms. So uh, all of the early div diverging lineages of angiosperms, plus all the magnolids and some early diverging lineages of monocots and eudacots. And they used uh, these um, new phylogenies obtained from DNA sequence data uh, to reconstruct uh, the evolution of uh, key characters, including floral characters across the flowering plants. So this is one example from one of their publications. And uh, they use only parsimony in this uh, data set. And uh, what they found is uh, possibly that the ancestor of all flowering plants had many parts, as you can see here in these floral diagrams. I'm sorry, I'm struggling a little bit with my cursor, but do you see my cursor? Uh, yeah. So at the base here, you see two possible floral diagrams reconstructing many um, tepals, stamens, and a few carpels, but you see the arrangement was completely uncertain, was ambiguous. There was one uh, spiral version on the left, left hand side and one uh, world version on the right hand side. Um, so when we started this work about 10 years ago, we, we had a, a lot of admiration for that work, but we thought we could take it uh, an extra step further. We wanted to sample more flowering plants. We wanted to represent, we wanted to score traits for species, not for higher taxa. As you can see here on the tips of the, the tree, we have some genera, but also entire families. I'll show you an example here, Loraceae. Uh, arguably, Loraceae are quite constant in some of the characters, but that's 3,000 species. And so here, Loraceae are scored with their presumed ancestral states. And so that sort of assumes that we know what the ancestral states of Loraceae might have been. And in fact, we don't really know in many cases. So we wanted to skip that level of um, assumption and go through a direct inference by scoring on a species. And we also wanted to apply some uh, alternative uh, methods for reconstructing traits. So uh, before I continue, I should specify uh, more clearly what we're talking about here. So uh, when I talk about the ancestral flower in this talk, I'll be referring to the crown node of angiosperms. And so in phylogenetic analysis, the crown node is the most recent common ancestor of all living members of flowering plants. It is not the only ancestor. In fact, there are ancestors all the way down the stem lineage. There is uh, a possible infinity of ancestors. We don't know what they look like. We don't know how many species we may have counted here, uh, but it's just to show there is many ancestors. So there's the crown node and then all the way back to the stem node, which is the divergence with their sister group. Um, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty here. So I'll just be focusing on that crown node. Uh, that figure is uh, taken from a review that Susanna Magallan and I wrote uh, a few years ago uh, to remind ourselves that there's so many key questions in uh, angiosperm macroevolution that remain entirely unsolved. Um, and some of these questions illustrated on that figure are, uh, in particular, the age of the crown node of angiosperms. Uh, in my opinion, uh, not everyone would agree with that is uh, entirely unknown at this stage. It's somewhere between 140 and 250 million years. Uh, that we can probably say, but uh, many people disagree on the actual age. Some people think it's very old, other people think it's very young. Um, in fact, I think we, we still don't know. But the other important thing that we don't know is how the different characters that define the flowering plants uh, the, the bisexual flowers with the perianth, the, the double fertilization, 
the vessels, there's many, many, many characters. How did these assemble along the stem lineage? How, in which order they came? That remains a completely unknown question. And the reason for that is we don't have any uh, stem uh, lineage fossils along that line. We have a few groups of fossil seed plants that might be related to angiosperms. I mentioned Benetitalis earlier, Glossopterids are another one, uh, but we don't really have uh, angiosperm looking like uh, fossils along the stem lineage. So a lot of questions remain, but uh, luckily we have good understanding of the phylogeny and we can answer already some questions. And this is what I'm trying to do here. So the paper I wanted to talk to you about was this paper that we published uh, in 2017 uh, called The Ancestral Flower of uh, Angiosperms and its Early Diversification. And one of the figures of this paper is the one here on the, on the right-hand side. It is a uh, 3D model uh, that was based on our results from our reconstruction. So some of you might have seen it, uh, maybe not. Uh, it became quite controversial, and I'll go back to this uh, later in my talk. But what I want to tell you here is the story of how we came to reconstruct that model and what, uh, what our methods were and what the questions remaining are. Um, I just want to ask uh, the organizers, is there any question yet uh, that I might answer at this stage? Uh, no, I don't see any questions at the moment in the chat. No okay. El, les recuerdo a, a nuestra audiencia que pueden hacer preguntas durante la plática y las pueden poner en el chat y podemos hacer estas pausas de cuando en cuando para responder preguntas particulares. Gracias. Thank you. So please, please do not hesitate. I'll be more than happy to, to stop. So to, to get to this point, uh, actually, so 10 years ago, when I was uh, still working in Paris, I, I had these, these dreams that all those things I wanted to do, and I, I sort of took a really um, strong risk at that time was to, to undertake a, a project that will never finish. <laughs> and I call it the eFlower project. And uh, it's a career long object objective. So it continues, it will continue as long as I'm alive, probably. And it started on a grant proposal that we didn't get. So I assembled together uh, 14 people that I knew who were uh, experts in various aspects of um, angiosperm phylogeny and floral morphology. We didn't get the grant, but we decided, well, let's do it anyway with some of these people. And this is where we are now. So the whole idea was that, uh, in this was back in 2010, 2011, we had a, already a, a, a remarkable understanding of relationships among flowering plants. This was a simplified tree that I did at that time. I have never redone that figure since then, but already back then, uh, molecular data had helped solve uh, most relationships among families of flowering plants. These, these are, this is a tree where every tip is a family. There's about 400 families of flowering plants. Of course, there's a lot of uncertainties remaining in particular details, especially in shallow nodes, some deeper relationships as well. Uh, but it is uh, very precious knowledge that we didn't have uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and it is really thanks to the, the molecular revolution in phylogenetics. At the same time, uh, for a very long time, uh, for more than 200 years, uh, flowers have been uh, looked at, observed, described in, in taxonomic descriptions, and more importantly, in the last 50 years, uh, considerably uh, studied with uh, new tools such as scanning electron microscopy and currently now um, uh, X-ray tomography. So there's, there's an enormous amount of knowledge on floral structure. And so the whole basis of the whole, the whole point of eFlower is to put these two together. What we know about flowers and what we know about phylogeny together to reconstruct a, a, a better understanding of floral evolution through deep time. I should mention that a lot of people in the world are studying floral evolution from many different angles. This is not the only way to study floral evolution. Obviously studying uh, plants pollinator networks is really important knowledge. Uh, but what, what I should mention is perhaps most of the knowledge that we do have about floral evolution at the moment is mostly uh, in very, 
uh, focused clades of the, the phylogeny. So particular genera, particular families, there's a lot of studies there, a lot of information has been given, but the deeper you go in time, uh, the more questions remain. And so this is what Iflar wanted to address. So we, we wanted to address quite a, few, uh, uh, quite a few questions, but some of these uh, that I've written down here is uh, what were flowers like, not just at the uh, root node of angiosperms, but also in different clades of angiosperms. How are floral traits correlated with one another and also how traits influence diversification rates. Um, so for that first paper, we assembled a data set that was um, with a sampling strategy that was based on the uh, groundbreaking work that Susanna published with uh, uh, other colleagues in 2015 in New Phytologies, uh, which was at that time uh, the best uh, data tree, in my opinion, of flowering plants that was available out there. Uh, we actually started our work, our collaboration uh, two years before, so two years before uh, she published that tree, we agreed that we would score the same floral traits for every one of the species in that tree. The reason why that tree was particularly good compared to the collection of trees available at that time was that it had a very good sampling of flowering plants, 792 species, um, which is a lot, but at the same time, uh, small enough that it was a goal that we could tackle. And it represented most of the families recognized at that time and most of the orders. And more importantly, uh, the time component of this tree was, uh, was particularly well done because it was based on uh, more than 100 fossil calibrations. So what we did uh, is we collected uh, information on 27 floral traits uh, that we recorded in a database that I developed for the purpose of that project called uh, Proteus. And a key aspect of this database is it's a multi-author uh, database. So many people collaborate on different projects. Uh, this particular data set was built actually by 47 different people, uh, some of them contributing more than others. Uh, and, but in, and importantly, every single record is tracked to a, an explicit source. So if you ask me, where did you get that information on that species? I think that's wrong. I can tell you in less than a minute exactly who did it, when, and from what source. And that's been really, really useful in us uh, improving the quality of this data set over time. So this particular data set was based on 13,000 uh, observations linked to almost uh, 1,000 explicit references. And I should mention, actually, the oldest reference was from Jussieu, uh, I think, um, a French botanist uh, who was uh, already reporting information on flowers uh, at the time of the French Revolution. And it's just to show you how information in systematics has a really long life cycle. We still are using information from very, very old descriptions. So just this is just a snapshot of the principle of uh, Proteus, the database that we use to build this uh, data set. And uh, on the top level is a uh, traditional morphological matrix with a sort of a two by two table of text and characters. Uh, but what Proteus is adding is this depth of observation. So instead of just having one single score, we're recording all of the data that are contributing to um, the summary of uh, a character value uh, for a, a given taxon. And so what we're tracking again that, that's specific to Proteus is references and uh, users and when they're recording the data. Uh, and lastly, just to show you, it's, it's been growing quite slowly, but steadily over time. More than 100 people have used it so far. It's still very much alive at the moment for various projects. Uh, and uh, now I want to tell you a little bit about this little bump in history, this 2013 boost in data. How did that happen? So the story is that we were starting to... Uh, to do that project, we had these already quite ambitious goals of scoring every family of flowering plants. Uh, and we realized soon enough that we weren't enough people. It was a lot of time. Every time we look for data, it can take hours just to, to find the, the correct information on a particular species. So we decided to call for help. And what we did was to uh, invent a new system uh, that we call the eFlower Summer School. And the whole idea was that um, we invited uh, about uh, 15 students uh, from all over the world, mostly Europe, but, uh, but the, the one person came from China, for instance, and another one from Brazil. 
um, and another one from Mexico. The whole idea was that uh, we wouldn't invite them to come and work for us, uh, input hardcore data of floral traits in our database for uh, six days, locked in this uh, beautiful room at the University of Vienna. Uh, but in exchange, we paid their travels. We paid their food, their drinks. Um, we had seminars every day to stop the, 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 the rhythm of data scoring. So these are where our invited speakers. Uh, Susanna came over for that particular uh, first summer school as, a, as an invited speaker, but also other colleagues. Uh, and, uh, and in exchange, uh, we also uh, promised them co-authorship of the paper. So it was a, it was a good, de good deal for everyone. And it, was, it still to this day was uh, one of the most uh, fantastic experiences of my professional life uh, to, to have this live experiment with all of those wonderful people, many of whom have gone on to uh, take academic careers now. And some of them are collaborating together without us. So it's, it's been really nice. Uh, interactions with all those people. What we did uh, with these, so we, we ended up entering actually only 50% of the data in this uh, one week, and the other 50% took another two years <laughs> of completion, curation, et cetera. But it really helped us to get a start. A uh, little word about the methods that we used. Uh, we used uh, three uh, methods for reconstructing ancestral states, so parsimony, uh, but also maximum likelihood and a Bayesian approach called uh, reversible jump uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. I'll explain very briefly what this means uh, in a few minutes. All of these methods take data in so a data mat matrix in a phylogeny to make an inference about uh, reconstructed uh, ancestral states. None of them uh, is perfect, but together uh, they might give us a sense of confidence the results. We also use different backbones for the molecular uh, phylogeny of flowering plants. So the main one was a tree from uh, Magayan and all, but we also altered uh, this tree in various ways uh, to take into account some additional relationships that are still uncertain, in particular, the relationship between monocots, eudicots, and magnolids. So in the end, we didn't do one analysis, we did five. And in fact, we did 10 because we re repeated every analysis with either angiosperms being young or very old, uh, just to test the sensitivity of our results to these uh, particular assumptions. Uh, I'll show you, I'll start with one key result that I think is uh, uh, paradoxically, perhaps our strongest result. Uh, it is a result that is not surprising uh, but that yet was absolutely uncertain until we published that study. And it is the sex of the ancestral flower. So our results uh, very strongly support that the uh, first uh, flowering plants, or at least the most recent common ancestor of all flowering plants, had bisexual flowers, such as this little diagram here with uh, both a gynecium and an andresium, so carpels and stamens in the same reproductive structure in that uh, many, many times throughout the uh, history of flowering plants, uh, flowers have become secondarily, uh, well, have become unisexual, and sometimes they have, have also reversed back to uh, bisexuality. Um, and so this is, this, this is the full tree that you see, the colors are indicating the particular character states. And uh, as you can see from the pie charts here, we get like very strong confidence in that result from, from the model-based approaches. I should mention that because Umbrella, which you can't see here, but it's hidden, it's like the very first line you see it's blue. Because Umbrella is unisexual, uh, that means that parsimony reconstructions are still ambiguous as they have for forever. Uh, so if, if, we, if we rely on parsimony to reconstruct this result, we still don't know. If we take a model-based um, approach to this problem, we have an answer. And so what is the right answer? We probably don't know, but in that case, um, I should explain uh, why, why this difference. So these model-based approaches, one of the key advantages, they have a lot of limitations. So they are based on models that have limitations, assumptions, et cetera. But their main value is that they do take time into account. So this result is based on the method allowing itself at least 140 million years for the sex to change. And we know sex have changed many, many times throughout the evolution of flowering plants. So why didn't, why could it not have changed in Amborella? In that case, um, 
everyone is absolutely ready to accept that Umbrella has changed its sex over this time uh, for various reasons. So first of all, uh, the female flowers of Umbrella actually have remnants of male parts. They have staminodes, uh, sterile stamens. Uh, and secondly, there have been observations in greenhouses, in particular, I think in a greenhouse in Lyon uh, by colleagues, uh, uh, the group of Charlie Scott, who have observed that there are actually bisexual flowers that can be produced. So they have demonstrated that uh, sex in flowers of Ambera is actually fluid. And in some conditions, they can be bisexual flowers. So it really shows that Ambera has still the capacity of producing bisexual flowers. And it is very, very likely. This is probably the result that I would be very surprised if, if it was overturned in the future that the ancestral flower was bisexual. Um, here's another example that we consider very strong for, from our study. It's the reconstructed ancestor from a very large clade of flowering plants, uh, which uh, colleagues in 2007 have uh, proposed a new name for the pantapetali. So it's, it's uh, highlighted here in these yellow to red colors. You see it's, uh, it's about 75% of the diversity of flowering plants. It is uh, more or less what was called for a long time the core eudicots. So a very core part of the eudicot clade. And most of these flowers have either five, sometimes four or three um, uh, parts in their uh, parient and stamens. And they're also whorled. And they also have a differentiated parent with sepals and uh, petals, which have represented in two colors here. So what we have here on the right hand side is just one of our characters. And that character is, is the uh, merism. So how many parts per whorl for the parent, the, uh, the, the sterile parts of the flower, so the, the petals and sepals. And we found that the perianth, the ancestral perianth of Panabedli was pentamerous. And we found that in every single analysis that we did, whether it was parsimony, MP, uh, maximum likelihood, or uh, this Bayesian approach uh, that we did. And when we could get some scores of confidence in likelihood and Bayesian approaches, these scores were very high. These are the uh, marginal, uh, the proportional marginal likelihoods uh, post reconstruction. You see they're very close to one. So it's very strong support. Uh, but more importantly, in the Bayesian approach, uh, over 10 million generations, these probabilities are centered around a very, very high probability. So these are 95% credibility intervals. And these take into account uh, phylogenetic uncertainty, so different relationships, different times, different values for the parameters of the models, uh, and also even the model is varying through these uh, analysis. Uh, just, just before I explain that a little further, we have other reconstructed characters for the sclade. Uh, so we, we reconstructed also as having two worlds of stamens, five and five, and five few scarpels. So we've decided to represent some of the results with these botanical diagrams and also uh, this little floral formula here. Um, it is not a surprising result at all. Uh, many people would have predicted it, it, but it's kind of nice and cute to finally have uh, analytical confirmation of something that people have presented for a long time by even calling that clade panapelli. It was never really demonstrated that panapelli were actually ancestrally pan panameras. Um, so we were quite happy to find that result. Uh, and so just to explain a little bit what the reversible jump MCMC is doing, uh, in that particular case, it was not possible to just have a binary character. There's too many conditions. So there are dimerous, trimerous, tetramerous, and pentamerous variant in, uh, in, in flowering plants. There's more, but these are the main states. So um, the simplest model had four uh, different states, and that makes um, uh, 12 different uh, parameters is the, in the most free model. So this, this is an example here. This is our... Um, uh, Q matrix that's linked with this model and has 12 different uh, rate parameters. That's a lot of information to estimate from the data. And so traditional likelihood approaches, what do they what they do is they fix the model uh, with more or less uh, parameters. So they can either assume that all are equal or they're all different. These are the two extremes. And we conduct an analysis and we get a result. Uh, what's not satisfying here is there's a lot of models in between. In fact, there's uh, 27 million models. 
uh, that you can create by making two parameters equal or forbidding some transition, putting them to zero. So what the Bayesian approach that we use in this paper does uh, is, is quite remarkable. It's not, it's, we didn't design that. That was, uh, that was uh, implemented in a program called Base Traits, uh, which was designed by uh, Mark Pedro and colleagues uh, quite a while back. But we applied it to this data set. And what it does is that it integrates over many, many, many models. Uh, so it takes, it takes off the load of having to assume what the model is and it integrates over these many models. So uh, just skipping down a few notes, going back to the ancestor of flowering plants, this is, this is what we obtained if we just looked at the most uh, likely results, the, the, the best states that we obtain across different analysis. So we reconstructed the most recent command ancestor of all flowering plants as having a world, uh, a world perianth, not a spiral perianth. Uh, with many parts, more than 10, and these parts are arranged arrange in worlds of three. So if you take more than 10 world and arrange in worlds of three, um, that, uh, that's one of the possibilities, to have four concentric worlds, um, as I've uh, drawn here for the perianth. There could have been more. Um, and we reconstruct actually the same uh, structure for the Andresium, at least uh, four worlds of uh, three parts each for the stamens, and surprisingly, we found the carpels to actually be spiral in these first analysis. So what we did here, we weren't quite sure about the significance of these results. Uh, and we'll never know if they're uh, true. We'll never be sure. But what we decided is to take our results as they were without applying our filters of what we thought it should be um, and publish that. Uh, I should mention at this stage is a lot of uncertainty remaining to some of these particular traits, in particular, the philotaxis, the arrangement of parts as spiral world, uh, remain quite uncertain. We knew that. Uh, but instead of choosing spiral over world because that's what people thought it was, we decided to publish what our results were saying, uh, which according to many morphologists actually is not absurd at all. Uh, and so that, that's how we came to these uh, conclusions. And we decided to communicate with the greater public by making a 3D reconstruction of that. And I'll explain it, uh, in a few minutes how, how that was done. Um, so just to summarize our study, we, we were able to infer uh, ancestral states for different keynotes. Uh, we focused on 15 key named clades of the flowering plant phylogeny. And this is a, another figure from that paper where we have these reconstructed floral diagrams for uh, the angiosperms, but also the pentapelli. I mentioned that a, a little earlier. We have a very interesting uh, hypothesis for the eudicots that might have started as dimerous, um, which you, you do see in, in some early diverging uh, eudicots, such as the papaveraceae, for instance. And, and then we have the monocots with their uh, more simplified trimerous model that's um, very easily derived from the uh, ancestor of flowering plants. So this has uh, allowed us to rethink uh, floral evolution in, a, in a, I, I think, a, a quite, quite a different way, uh, because if this is true, we still don't know if it's true, but if, if, if these were uh, world flowers at the very start of flowering plants, it's easy to shed some worlds, to reduce the flowers to get to the monocots. Uh, to get to the magnolids, we reconstruct the same ancestor, but within magnolids, we also shed some worlds to get flowers of magnolias, uh, anonaceae, loraceae. These are really easily um, derived from these ancestors. To get to the pandapedalee, however, uh, it gets a bit more complicated. Our results are suggesting that perhaps instead of shedding, you are reducing the merism from three to two, and then something happens. Uh, from this model to the model of Pantapedaly. And one of the things that possibly may have happened uh, is a fusion of the worlds. So it is not impossible that the corolla of the Pantapedaly is the result of fusion of the two inner worlds of the ancestral eudicots and possibly the two inner worlds of angiosperms. And if that's the case, it's also not impossible that 
the uh, perianth remaining in monocots is, is just the original two inner worlds. There's other possibilities. It could be the two outer worlds or something else. But it would mean that the corolla of the panopelli uh, perhaps is not homologous to the corolla or the inner world of monocots, but perhaps it's homologous to the entire perianth of monocots which would not surprise Evo Devo specialists, which for a long time have uh, found that uh, B-class expression genes are uh, their, 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 their domains of expression uh, is very similar across the entire perianth of monocots to that uh, found in uh, the coral of um, eudicots. So I'm not sure I'm doing good justice to what I'm saying here, but I just wanna explain that this study has allowed us to challenge quite a few established dogmas on floral evolution. And a lot of the comparative studies that are being done, a lot of the interpretation of Evo Devo studies are sometimes made on assumptions of homology between uh, flowers that in fact have never really been established, at least not based on ancestral state reconstructions. So the power of that study, in my opinion, is not to have delivered final results, but to have allowed us to rethink uh, floral evolution in possible alternative ways that might help us uh, progress. I hope that doesn't sound too arrogant, but I just wanted to see where, express where I think we have arrived at, at this stage. Um, and just to finish on, on that part, I wanted to uh, mention that, of course, the fossil record should, in theory, hold some key clues about the origin of flying plants. And some of my colleagues might even think these are the only clues. We shouldn't even bother looking at the phylogeny. Uh, the problem is that the oldest fossils of flowering plants are no older than 130 million years old. Uh, that is a fact that uh, not everyone agrees with. Every now and then there are reports of a Jurassic flower, uh, but these are very quickly dismissed by uh, a majority of the paleobotanical community. So at this stage, we really don't know for sure that there has been any fossils of flowering plants, at least of crown flowering plants, before 130 million years. There might be some stem lineage pollen grains, but no flowers. So uh, because the ancestor of all flowering plants is at least 140 million years, you cannot use the fossil record to have a direct confirmation of uh, the ancestral flower. Maybe we'll find that fossil and maybe it will completely invalidate my results, uh, or maybe it will suggest that some of, some of it was correct. But what we did in that paper was to have a, just a quick look at what we knew of the fossil flowers once they arrived. They arrived uh, in, uh, in the second part of the early Cretaceous. And what's remarkable about the earliest fossil record um, that we know in terms of flowers is that it was already very diverse. As you can see here, there's a diff like very different structures. This, this uh, picture is taken from a, a, a groundbreaking review by Pat Herendino in 2017. Uh, but it's largely based also on the collaborative work by uh, Austin Marifries, Peter Crane, and Kai Pedersen that they published uh, in a book in 2011. And you, you see these, uh, these flowers here, they're diverse, but there's a majority of actually world flowers, world trimers flowers. There's also the odd pentamerous one, and there's one or two uh, spiral flowers, also very simple flowers. So um, we think this does not confirm our results, but it is compatible with the prediction that we would have from uh, the scenario, uh, which would say that by 130 million years, uh, we already expect quite a few diverse floral morphologies, including possibly a majority of world flowers. So there's big questions remaining here. Uh, we haven't put together the fossils with our reconstructions. The fossils have been only used as um, calibration points for dating so far. And so it will be really interesting to see when we have the fossils in the phylogenies, what the results, uh, how the results are gonna uh, be affected. Uh, I'll just take a, uh, a mini pause here. Are, are there any questions so far in the chat? Um, no, we don't have any questions in the chat. We only have greetings from Honduras. <laughs> and we have about 70 people in the audience. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Yeah, so as expected, I'm 
I'm taking my time and it's taking uh, longer than expected. So that's it, it was good that I plan on 30 minutes because it's already been 45 minutes. <laughs> so what I'd like to uh, do in the, the second part is just take a step back and uh, think a bit about the science communication aspect of that story. So as I, as I mentioned to you, um, we thought that uh, floral diagrams wouldn't speak much to the public. And so we decided to take the risk of uh, creating this 3D model. And I mentioned that it was a risk because um, for several reasons. First of all, there was a lot of uncertainty in our results. I've highlighted here uh, a few of them. So I've, uh, I've said that the, the bisexual flower was highly confident result, but when you see uh, the information on other characters, such as the fact that it was world, it's less certain. So when you do one model, uh, instead of the actual infinity of possibilities that could be inferred from our results, we take the risk of people having the false idea that we know for sure what the flower was like. But as anything in science, uh, it's a hypothesis. It's a working hypothesis that helps us uh, think and visualize what the results might have meant. Uh, the second risk that we took is that uh, by drawing a 3D model, we had to take uh, arbitrary choices on things that we have not reconstructed. This includes uh, the shapes, uh, the relative sizes of the organs, and the colors. So we have no idea what color it was. These are absolutely arbitrary colors, and so are the shapes. Um, the funny thing, though, is that it really worked. It really worked in helping people relate to this result. And uh, we uh, wrote quite a few, we, we wrote a, a media release, but we also translated it into six languages uh, because we had a lot of co-authors. We had 36 co-authors on the paper, including all the students from the summer school. So we wanted to reach out a broad community. And the media really liked it for some reason. They pick, picked up on it. Uh, it was a strange moment for me because I had just moved to Sydney. I hadn't started my new job in Sydney and I was there by myself <laughs> at the other end of the world having to uh, uh, sell uh, the results from the work that I did in the last 10 years. It was also, uh, sadly, the, the paper came out after the uh, last International Botanical Congress in Shenzhen. So many of us were there and we were hoping that the, the news would be released uh, during the Congress because it would have been great, but no, it was released just a week after. Uh, but the media liked it. And uh, these are just a few examples of the, the titles that came. And um, thinking back at it, uh, I think no one in the media or in the broader public really worried about the philotaxis of the parents of the ancestral flower. What they learned uh, primarily is that uh, it may have been bisexual, uh, or more importantly, I think a lot of the people by reading the story uh, realized suddenly that all flowering plants at some point had one ancestor. They all came from one, one spot. And so it was a really interesting uh, exercise in science communication where we did a study for particular reasons, uh, found a result, and that was a vector to teach something completely different to people about uh, evolution. Uh, of course, the fact that all flowering plants are monophyletic and came from one uh, common ancestor is not a result of our study. It was actually an assumption that's uh, consistent with all phylogenetic data that had been obtained so far. Uh, but it's interesting what, what came out in, in this. Um, but clearly the image was very important in this vector. And I think uh, on, on the bottom right as one of the headlines that I was most uh, glad about. It was the LGBTQ newspaper, which uh, decided that it was so cool that the first flower was bisexual. No one actually realized that most flowers are bisexual. And so this was another interesting uh, effect of that study is to make people realize how, how different flowering plants are and how diverse they are as well. Um, and just, just, so, uh, just to, to provide some statistics, there were a lot of original stories uh, uh, written, uh, many radio interviews that we did in 24 languages in 38 countries. So it, was really, it was my uh, most interesting experience with the media and I learned a lot through that. Uh, but the key message here actually, um, if any of you uh, has or will be involved in such uh, experiments to sell your paper to the media, uh, you have to be really proactive. None of this happened by chance. 
we we thought we had a chance to talk to the media with this particular story. So we looked for the attention. We wrote the press releases. Uh, otherwise, it's it's unlikely that they would have heard about it. Um, and it's not just an. It might be perceived as an exercise to uh, make people talk about your work and uh, sell yourself to other colleagues. Um, and part of it might be true, but most importantly, it's also uh, an, a rare opportunity to talk to the public about science, about modern science. Uh, that's why we did it uh, primarily. Uh, and it, then it went just mad in the in the next few years. There were artists that decided to create those uh, uh, 3D models to, to to 3D print the 3D models. So here's an example with uh, in a museum in uh, Bonn, I think in Germany, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, these are uh, the two kids of two of my co-authors, Jurg and Maria, and some of their family. And these are the little ancestral flowers being reproduced as a as an artist exhibition. And the background is the one from my uh, uh, intro slide, and it's uh, another artist who decided to um, draw a Cretaceous landscape. There's quite a few scientific mistakes in there, uh, but in interestingly, you see the ancestral flower here is in this little bush here. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca Hernandez, who did a PhD with Susanna at, uh, at UNAM, uh, this is Susanna, uh, had an ancestral floral cake for her dissertation. That was really uh, lovely to see. And one day, randomly, I saw that uh, one person in a lab in uh, in France uh, working on floral evolution had decided to dress as an ancestral flower uh, with this hat for a party. Uh, and I really like the the caption that I found. Also, there's a black box for the unknown ancestors. Uh, that's her T-shirt. I tried I tried to put that on my on the back of my. Uh, on my back uh, two weeks ago at a party that the theme was primitive and I had no idea what, what to try. So I decided to put <laughs> a picture of <laughs> the ancestral flower, but no one really cared then. So it was like the wrong crowd. Um, so how did we get there? I just wanted to, to tell you the story of the drawing this diagram. Initially, I, I really wanted to do a digital drawing. I didn't have those skills. So I asked around for illustrators what they thought. And we've um, had this, uh, uh, great colleague, uh, Agathe Vermance, who is a scientific illustrator at the French uh, Museum of Natural History in Paris and was the partner of one of the co-authors. And she said, I'll, I'll do it, but I'll do it my way. And her way was to uh, first do a drawing to visualize a little bit more and then do a, a, a life size sculpture. You see my bag here. The sculpture is, was really gigantic, but it was the way that she could actually um, uh, visualize and modify the parts. We, I had to come uh, many times to the museum to organize the parts so they would actually be world and in worlds of three. It was quite a funny exercise to play with the, uh, the ancestral flower life size. And so she used this uh, adult Play-Doh called Plasiline and arranged those parts. We took a picture of it many times. We discussed it with, with co-authors. And of course, some co-authors thought it would look completely different, even within the same realm of results. And at that stage, we took the decision also, let's not worry about it. It is an artist's impression. There's many ways to interpret that. Let's just let her do the way she, she visualizes this flower. Um, eventually, the flower was scanned. Uh, so it wasn't uh, CT scanned because of the material that was used to this flower, but instead it was, uh, we used a method called uh, photogrammetry, I think, which is used uh, to scan some skulls uh, by some vertebrate anatomists. And so we took uh, thousands of pictures and then a computer model was created based on these pictures. And this is what we obtained. And then it was colored by other colleagues in Vienna. So it was a real collaborative work by uh, people involved in uh, at least uh, uh, three different countries to get to that point. Again, a lot of arbitrariness was placed here, the colors, the shapes. I insisted that uh, Agat should never look at uh, a particular living flowers in the process, but it is not impossible that uh, water lilies or magnolias were in her mind when uh, she put these shapes together. So uh, people have expressed the resemblance of our model with magnolias or water lilies, but truly there's many differences and we shouldn't make these uh, conclusions. 
And just to finish on science communication, so uh, this was a, a very uh, interesting poster that was printed uh, in a giant size in the corridor of the metro in Paris Montparnasse, and I never saw it. <laughs> this appeared a year after I moved to Sydney. Uh, but it's to show you how publicized this model has been. This was uh, led by the CNRS uh, in France, who, who had the image and then asked if they could borrow it for this uh, long poster. Um, so we know this model was probably wrong. There's probably a lot of results that will be refined in the future. I still think it, would wor it was worth the risk because people talked about it. It generated a lot of um, ideas. People have written entire papers about whether or not it was spiral or world. We still don't know, but I believe this conversation has been very productive to the, to the state and will probably help us uh, um, refine uh, this work in the future. Any questions or shall I just continue? There are some questions uh, about the previous part of the talk. I don't know if you prefer to just finish this part and then we'll have questions at the end. Yeah, probably. Uh, uh, in that case, I'll probably wait until the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so just to finish, I'd like to share a few perspectives on what we're up to at the moment. There's, um, there's various new projects that have derived from that, from our perspective, but the key one is uh, what we call Paleo e flower. So we're focusing on the fossil record and trying to put that in the picture, in the broader picture of floral evolution in angiosperms. And this work is, is done by, with my two key partners since the beginning, so Jörg Schoenenberger and Maria von Balthasar, uh, who work at the University of Vienna, who helped me, who, who, who co-ran the, the first eFlower summer school um, uh, with me, and also um, are uh, really complementary in expertise to mine. So they know the fossil record much better than I do, but I also know flowers much better than I do. So what I brought in this was uh, more the expertise on, uh, on, on uh, doing the analysis of ancestral state reconstruction, putting the phylogeny together, but um, they brought the real knowledge about the flowers. And so what we want to know is where fossils, fossil flowers fit in the phylogeny of flowering plants, and also ultimately what they can tell us about floral evolution once they're in that framework. And uh, just a, as an example, is a paper that we published just a few months ago in the American Journal of Botany. It was a proof of concept of um, a new approach to conduct phylogenetic analysis of fossil flowers. And um, just to summarize, uh, the method that we use in this paper was not novel at all. It has been used by uh, various colleagues for a long time, but what we did for the first time, uh, uh, more or less in that paper, was to conduct analysis where fossils could go anywhere in the phylogeny of flowering plants. So we used our eFlower data sets as support to conduct a novel type of phylogenetic analysis where we don't assume that the fossil is in a particular clade before we conduct any study or analysis. And so um, what we did is we used this background, as I said, the same tree, the same data sets. Uh, we expanded the data set a little bit. We added a few traits, in particular, some uh, pollen traits. Uh, and we scored uh, 10 fossils in that paper for the same traits. So it's a combination of a uh, new fossil data with the previous uh, uh, data set for, from eFlower. And what we conducted were uh, so-called molecular backbone or molecular scaffold analysis. So we fixed the phylogeny of flowering plants. This, uh, this uh, completely fixed tree, all of the relationships among extant species uh, cannot change. Uh, and then we use persimony uh, to get a score of uh, where the fossil fits. So we actually test every single position in the tree. There's 1,582. Uh, and I wrote a little R script to do that, and it's actually really simple. And so we, we allow the fossil to go anywhere in the tree and see, see what happens. Uh, just to show you an example, this is a fossil flower called Moldinia, uh, described from the mid-Cretaceous of Germany. And the flower, if you look at it, um, actually is quite reminiscent of uh, uh, living flowers of uh, family Loraceae. Uh, which tends to have two worlds of perianth. You might see here in this reconstruction, one world and there's one world in the back. Uh, and also two or more worlds of stamens. 
And importantly, the stamens here have basal appendages, which are uh, nectaries that are typical of, of Loraceae, and just a single carpal in the center. So the morphology of that fossil really highlighted the relationship with uh, Lor Loraceae, but it was never really tested in any uh, full analysis of all flowering plants. And so we scored 22 characters. Uh, these, are, these are not all of the characters that you can observe in the flower. They're just the characters that we had in our data set. This is the previous assignment. And when we ran the analysis, uh, we found only five most parsimonious positions. And all of them are in or very close to Loraceae. Here's a little detail of the actual phylogeny. So this is family Loraceae. It goes in two of the internal branches, also the stem branch of Loraceae, possibly the stem branch of the sister group of Loraceae, which is uh, Monimiaceae and Hernandiaceae. Um, so it's just to show like how powerful these analysis can be. Um, obviously, we don't know the answer, but there's a lot of good reasons to think that this is Loraceae, including these basal nectaries, which we didn't score in our analysis. So it was very reassuring to see that if you allow this fossil, which to some of you might look like a, a monocots, to go anywhere in the tree, including in the monocots, in the eudacots, anywhere, it actually goes in the Loraceae. And so even with that few characters, we have uh, some interesting power of discovery uh, of uh, finding where fossil fits. But here's another example. This is a, 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 the so-called Rose Creek flower that was known for a long time, but Steve Manchester and colleagues recently formally described as Dacotentus. And it is a fully pentamerous flower with two whorls. Here are the petals, there's the sepals in the background, and there's 10 stamens and five carpels that are fused. Uh, it might remind you of something we saw earlier today. When we do the analysis, uh, we find them in various positions in the, in the panopetaly. Uh, we do find them close to the fabalis, which is where the author said it should be, but we find uh, many other positions, 24 in total. Uh, we don't know, again, what the answer is, uh, but the power of such an analysis is to suggest many other positions that uh, perhaps some authors might not have thought about. Uh, and to be, tr to be honest, it is absolutely impossible to, for anyone to have uh, perfect knowledge of the entire diversity of flowering plants uh, to do these um, uh, hand scans, to, to think of every possible family that a fossil might be related to and look at it more closely. So we, we, we think of uh, these so-called paleo flower phyllo scans as sort of a first-round analysis to discover where a fossil might be before we look closer at some relationships. Interestingly, however, the floral diagram of the Quetanus is really, really close to uh, that reconstructed uh, for Panapetaly. And so it also highlights another property of these analyses. In the past, uh, many fossil flowers have been attempted to uh, solve to be a member of a family or of an extant order of flowering plants. But the reality is that some of these oldest fossil flowers, they might actually be on very deep lineages and stem lineages of very broad clades. And uh, with this tool, we can possibly identify these relationships. So what's next? We're uh, building a bigger data set. And for this, we're using a, a new data tree that we recently published with Santiago Ramirez Barahona, who works at UNAM, and uh, also together with Susana Magallon. And what we did there is we built a better tree with all of the families, 100% of the families sampled, including uh, the crown nodes of as many families as we could all of the orders and what we think is the, the largest number of fossil calibrations ever attempted. So um, I'm not giving a talk on this. I think that actually Santiago gave a talk recently in your same seminar series, uh, but I just wanna tell you we're doing, what we're doing now is scoring every species in that tree in our eFlower data sets so we can improve the sampling. We also conducted a new summer school uh, in Virginia uh, two years ago to help us build this new data set uh, where we added a, a stronger teaching component. So we taught uh, molecular dating and ancestral cell reconstruction methods in addition to getting data in the data sets. And we were about to have a new one uh, in Sydney uh, a year ago. And unfortunately we had to cancel it two weeks before the start because of COVID. Um, and the key 
uh, actor in what we're trying to do now in the Palio Ifra project is the PhD student Andrea uh, Lopez Martinez, which I'm co-supervising with uh, Susana. And her goal is, is really to put all that together. The new data tree, uh, the data set, which is now complete, largely thanks to her, we have data for every one of these uh, 1,200 species. Uh, and now she's conducting these uh, very exciting uh, analysis where the fossils are tips in the phylogeny. So stay put there. Hopefully there'll be more results in the future. All right. Well, thank you so much for your attention. I hope uh, that was clear and I will be uh, very happy to take any questions or comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much um for a great talk we do have questions <laughs> so i'm going to start reading them the first one is from jorge cortez who's a professor at the biology institute and it says how do you integrate the interaction of angiosperms with their pollinators in the reconstruction of ancestral angiosperms and their di diversification yep i'm just gonna write this down <laughs> I like because I take note of the questions that helps me think about the future. Unfortunately, we don't um, and we can't because uh, there are insufficient data, although there's an enormous amount of pollination data. These are not necessary for the same species that we have. We all know there's a lot of variation among different species of even the same genera, so we can't make those assumptions that what we know in one species applies to another. Um, and also there's this difficult problem. I think uh, you guys will know a lot more than, than I do, but um, it does not seem to be that common in the end that uh, highly specialized relationships between uh, plants and pollinators uh, exist. There's a lot of generalized pollination systems and that makes the questions even more difficult to answer because angiosperms have not only shifted pollinators over and over, but they've also shifted from generalized towards more specialized systems and occasionally back and forth. And so that mm -hmm. there is no current uh, really good comparative method that would take allow us to, to do these inferences, even if we had the data. Uh, that, that, that's where we are now. Uh, the question is, extremely important. And I hope that in the future, we'll have enough data to, to start attempting uh, solving that question. Okay, I guess that would also answer another question that we had that, that said uh, from Sofia Huerta, who is a student um, uh, in our program, ecology program. Um, so she said, with the reconstruction of the most recent ancestor of angiosperms, can you get an idea of the first pollinators? Or, uh, well, at least that's related to the mm -hmm. previous question. And then would it be useful to have information of the first floral visitors? Yeah, absolutely. We, we're dying to have that information. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I think there are very, very few records of... Um, plant pollinator interactions in the fossil record. There was a paper published, I think, last week or two weeks ago on, on Florivory in a very early Cretaceous uh, flower. And it was quite exciting, but these are like anecdotal, like it's just point observations. It's just one observation of probably many things that were already happening back then. Um, so to answer the first question, do we know what the ancestral pollinator was? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, we shall mention that uh, among early diverging uh, um, lineages of, of flowering plants, so the anagrade, um, Amborella anifilis, Astrobiliaris, uh, pollinators of living plants are uh, quite well known, in fact, and these tend to include a lot of thrips, uh, flies, and beetles. So these are like the three main groups of insects that have been talked about for basal angiosperms. Uh, I think uh, bee pollination and butterfly pollination came came about a little later uh, in the history of flowering plants. But we can't derive what we see today in these lineages to their ancestors 100 million years ago for various reasons. First of all, because shifts occur, have occurred, keep occurring all the time. And second of all, because the, the fauna was different, has evolved since then. 
And so even if we had pollination data on every single one of living flowering of living species of flowering plants, it would still be very hard to make that inference because not the same groups were in the same proportions in those regions where the ancestral um, flowering plants were. That being said, I, I think the fact that we found it to be bisexual, and I didn't mention it, but also with a perianth, that's a very strong result, very likely to have had a perianth, that says a lot about the likelihood that it was in, in, all, in all likelihood, in my opinion, uh, doing something with some, someone else. Um, there's, there's, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be bisexual unless you're being uh, pollinated by someone else. It's a high risk to be bisexual. There are strategies to avoid uh, self-fertilization, but it's still a high risk. And it's also a high cost probably to produce a perianth. So these are two key characters that uh, we interpret as having a role in, uh, in the interaction with, with the pollinators, which probably were insects, but no one really knows. I, mean, I think there's common understanding that it's more likely to have been insects than birds or mammals, uh, but who, how many, maybe it was a whole group of different, different orders coming in, why they were coming, uh, it's, not, it's not entirely clear. It, they, they may just have come for a meal, like eat, eat, eat floral parts, eat pollen, uh, not necessarily with that. Um, there was probably no nectar. We don't know that for sure at all, but uh, ne nectar glands uh, have evolved many times in the flowering plants. There's no nectar glands um, in uh, most of the early diverging flowering plants. Uh, but that just shows how many questions remain. So I would love to know, but we don't know yet. It was probably something <laughs> or a group of some things. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, the oh, next I should, one... Maybe oh, I should... Sorry. Uh, sorry, I should... I should, uh, um, I should ask... I should add something as well, is that um, a lot of us have often assumed that the ancestor of the ancestral flower was wind pollinated because most of the uh, living seed plants are wind pollinated except for cycads and some, some of the knee tail is. Mm -hmm. But there's very strong evidence now from the fossil record that many groups of extinct gymnosperms were already uh, insect pollinated. So insect mm -hmm. pollination is definitely not a key feature of flowering plants. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the way that flowering plants have done it might have been different and novel. So I just wanted to, to mention this before I forgot. Sorry. All right. Thank you. I think I'm going to read the, the, uh, the question, uh, one more question that's related to pollinators as well, and then I'll read the other questions. So this is from Erandi Ramirez, who was a former PhD student uh, with us in the uh, program of biologic, biological sciences. So she says, both symmetry and world fusion are associated with specialized pollination in extant species. Do you think that changes in floral development were paired with some pollinator radiations? Um, I would say yes, <laughs> probably. I mean, I. What we know, so I haven't talked about symmetry at all, but I'm, I'm very interested in that as well in, uh, in some of the work that we've done. So symmetry is a remarkable feature that has uh, changed many, many, many times during the evolutionary history of flowering plants. There's been, um, a former student counted at least 130 different origins of zygomorphy, of bilateral floral symmetry in flowering plants. And some recent papers uh, have shown that this could be uh, way more, in fact. So it is very likely that development just creates new morphs, uh, fuses, freeze, makes things bilateral, then flips back. Mm -hmm. But the reason why these characters are fixed and, and maintained over time and possibly act on diversification is probably because of their impact on something that they're doing with the function of the flower. And that being, uh, in many cases, linked with pollination. So um, 
I don't think the pollinator comes, well, obviously the pollinator doesn't arrive and then say, you know, be zygomorphic to help me out. But uh, there's probably a lot of selection that has occurred in zygomorphic variants to maintain and make them even more zygomorphic. Uh, if that makes any sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> All right. So the next question is by Pakli Ortega, who is uh, also a grad student in yep. um, program Biological Sciences. He says, interesting talk with interesting proposals. Do you have any idea about the size of the ancestral flower of the androscopes? Um, no, <laughs> uh, but it was small. <laughs> in all likelihood. So we didn't reconstruct size. Size is a highly variable character. So I didn't mention that um, we chose, uh, in general, quite conserved characters, because these are the only ones that we could actually score in all of the flowering plants. So we excluded uh, group-specific characters. But also in choosing more conserved characters, uh, we also chose uh, less variable characters. Because if a character is too variable, say changes uh, very quickly, is different between closely related species, that for the models that we, we use, that means a high rate of evolution. The, the likelihood functions that we apply to these um, questions will find that a high rate can explain the data better than low rates. And so when you have a very high rate, uh, you cannot infer the past. If, if size changes every minute, it's impossible to guess what happened millions of years ago. So for that reason, I, I, although I, I have not attempted it and I don't, I'm not aware of anyone who has attempted it, I believe that if we did apply some models on, of, of trade evolution to floral size, it'd be really hard to get an answer. But that being said, uh, what we do know is that nearly every fossil flower from, found from the Cretaceous is really tiny. They're really like microscopic flowers. Um, there are exceptions, I think, but most of them are really small. And so I think that would probably suggest that there has been some, um, some increase in size uh, of flowers uh, through time uh, in some groups. Obviously, some, some groups have remained very small or become secondarily smaller. That makes sense? But I would love to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know there's more questions, but I wanna, I wanna follow up on that, um, it, it, which is related to the sizes. Uh, as you said, you know, in evolution, in evolutionary time, size increased, right? Uh, as we know uh, today, uh, you know, uh, th those uh, um, original flowers uh, were, were small and they, they, you know, increased, the more derived flowers increased in size. Now, the, the, and the organ and the, gyno the gynoecium and the androecium also increased uh, in size. Um, so the, you know, the, there are probably several hypotheses for this. Um, would you say that uh, it, is, it is more related to, to the pollinators, you know, for attraction or to other uh, mechanisms such as uh, pollen competition, for example, that, that might be more related to, to a selection process within plants or other mechanisms that may have caused this increase in size um, in evolutionary time. What, what would you say about that? Um, probably nothing, because I would be really going outside of my expertise here. Um, I know there's been quite a bit of uh, interesting work very recently on um, floral economics. So on the physiology of flowers and the costs of associated with putting more or less investments in carbon uh, nutrients in the production of flowers, including the relative size and contributions of different organs. 
Uh, but potentially, I think this this would have the power of addressing that question. But I, I know, I know, I, it's, it's a... I, I I do believe so. Um, maybe I can go back to something that I'm more comfortable with. So I was, we were very very careful not to compare our ancestral flower with any any living flowering plants. People asked us, uh, journalists asked us many times. Uh, can you tell us an example of uh, similar flowers? And no, 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 there's not. There's, it, maybe there are, but there's always different characters. You can't do that. And uh, this, you, you can't find that flower nowadays. But why would you? Why would you have something uh, which we might actually consider, it was brilliant in the Cretaceous, but you know, that flower probably wouldn't survive two days nowadays. It was probably highly imperfect. It was just the first, you know, first by chance construct that has evolved numerous times in numerous ways, but mostly, you know, it probably had too many parts and they were not fused enough, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I think in these 140 or more millions of years, uh, flowers have become more efficient at doing what they do. Mm -hmm. And it is possible that through that history, for many of their pollinators, uh, increasing the size has made, given them access to more pollinators. Mm -hmm. I and mean, if you think about bird pollination, which is quite important in, uh, in the neotropics, at least, mm -hmm. uh, or, or here in Australia, uh, that doesn't really work on tiny flowers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So True. It's, it's possible that there was a pressure from the pollination spectrum to uh, increase the size and then have access to more pollinators, more strategies of specializing or generalizing. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, th things like the increase in size of the style in itself, uh, that is also, I mean, okay, he proposed uh, in the in, I, in the 70s, you know, that that was probably related to, to pollen competition. So, so it was more like a mechanism for, for selection of uh, better pollen, more related to the reproduction rather than the pollination in itself. Um, but anyways, I mean, this, these are thoughts and, and uh, I thought of asking it anyways. I, I know it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, there's not a clear answer for, for these kinds of, of things, but it's, it's kind of fun to, to think about it and discuss yeah, absolutely. it. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, I think we have one last question from the chat uh, from Karen Hernandez. And she says, what do you think were the main selective forces on the flowering plants to evolve the, to the pentamerous and differentiated worlds? Um, okay, uh, so I think for the number five, I would be really hard pressed to give a, a good answer to that. I, I, th I think there's probably good answers in development and I am not an expert on that. Um, but there's something funny about development. And I think uh, paradoxically, it comes from the Fibonacci numbers that are linked with the um, spiral series and so it's been proven for a very long time that when you have um spiral arrangement of parts the total number i, I can't even say that correctly but there's a tendency of of um series successive series to go in fibonacci numbers and these are three five, eight, 13, 21, etc. Mm -hmm. And so even though flowers may have, may have been ancestry world, we're not sure. Um, there is a spatial constraint for parts to be arranged in particular numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of flowers actually, some flowers that are world, they're uh, also developing a spiral where they have uh, what would it say a successive in initiation. 
again, I'm not really expert on that, but what, what we're looking at here is the anthesis, what, what's the arrangement of anthesis, but what's happening through development might be sometimes different. But there are um, mathematical reasons for which three, five, eight, et cetera, are stable numbers. So it's possible that the number five has been particularly stable uh, for the spatial arrangement of parts, uh, either pre-anthesis or post-anthesis. Um, just putting that, that down for the first question. The second one, what was it? Can you remind me? Uh, pentamery and? Oh, hold on a second. Oh, I see there's more questions now. Um, but yeah. Pentamer and differentiated worlds. Yeah, differentiate. I think the question of differentiation is a little easier to answer. What we often teach is that cells have a stronger role in protection of the bud prior to anthesis. Mm -hmm. And um, the petals, the corolla, have a stronger role in attraction. So it's, it's easy to imagine from an ancestral flower that might be undifferentiated that has found one way or another to create sterile decorations uh, mm -hmm. to progressively separate these and assign different functions. Instead of you doing everything, you do that, you do that. So I think that's quite easily explains um, yeah, why we have a different, and that differentiation has occurred many times, not just in Pentapelli, but as you know, many monocots have differentiated mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, we do have more questions, so <laughs> actually several more. Uh, so this is from someone that uh, doesn't have uh, its full name, um, DMS Rocha. What I think is interesting is not if this, is, if this model is right or not, but that it could be the basis uh, to uh, hypothesis or hypothesis to be tested. I guess that was a comment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. And then um, we have one from Yvonne Herrería Diego. She's a professor at Universidad Michoacana. She says, interesting talk. With this proposal, who is proposed as the pollinator or floral visitor? Well, the, <laughs> that was again, maybe that was, um, maybe these questions were, were done uh, before. Yep. Uh, you answered, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that, that's already answered. Um, Guillermo Huerta Ramos, have you considered reconstructing pollen traits? Are pollen fossils too problematic to constrain the models? Hmm. Um, they are not. There's actually a lot of fossil pollen. There's many more than fossil flowers. Mm -hmm. And Pollen traits are limited, but there are some. We can score the, the number of apertures, um, their shape. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the sculpture of the, the surface of the pollen is highly variable, so that would probably be difficult to reconstruct. But there's, there's, there's other things that, that we can do. The size is variable as well. Um, the main problem is that, so we, we've added some of these, we started to add these pollen characters to our paleo flower analysis, but that's because sometimes we find pollen in the fossil flowers. So that helps us constrain the positions of the fossils better. Mm -hmm. How pollen itself would help us inform the ancestral traits of the flower, that's not really clear. We don't understand enough about Mm -hmm. the correlation between pollen traits and floral traits to say anything, nor uh, to a large extent, the correlation between pollen traits and pollination. That would be a very interesting one to uh, pursue. But I, I, every time I looked, there was never a really good relationship. There's this, you know, people have said, well, small pollen is more likely to be wind pollinated uh, small and smooth pollen, whereas uh, big pollen, highly sculptured pollen tends to be more insect pollinated. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is there's been really, really few uh, recent tests of these, these questions. Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting one to pursue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Guillermo also said, I think pollen traits would also provide info to back up a hypothesis on the ancestral pollinator or pollination system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay. Um, so let me see. Uh, Maria Fernanda Martinez says, thank you so much for the talk. It's very interesting. Do you have any hypothesis about what or where, no, what were the first rewards uh, mm. in ancestral angiosperms, pollinator rewards? Hmm. Yeah, so I, I don't really know, but I would, like intuitively, I would say it would be food. Mm -hmm. uh, not just the pollen, but also pos po potentially the, the perian. Uh, because but the, the, way, the way I look at it and the way why I'm careful as well is because that occurs in magnolids and some early diverging angiosperms. So that's, we can't draw that conclusion. But we know that uh, this, this does occur. And so there are just all those flowers with very thick tepals that are being eaten at. Um, there's a lot of that's often associated with trapping, so temporary trapping of the insects, and then they eat their way out. And that often goes also with uh, uh, using the flower as, as, as a place to mate or, to, or, or as a nursery. So mm -hmm. some insects lay their eggs in these flowers. They also tend to be warmer. So thermogenesis occurs quite a bit. We have no idea if it did occur in the ancestral flower, but it's, uh, it's sort of like very comfy little habitats that some insects have used besides, besides food. Whether that played any role in the ancestral flower, I can't tell you. If it did, it probably would look very different from our model. <laughs> <laughs> Not all widespread like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so probably no nectar or volatiles, you say? I, I thought there was nectar, but that's just because of my very um, superficial understanding of the distribution of nectar glands across flowering plants. Mm. Uh, but I, I, I thought that there was, then we, we really don't know, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, we also have Ismael Santes. Um, the question is, was bisexuality in ancestral flowers key to their evolutionary success and current dominance? Um, I would just say yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, one clue of this is that um, unisexuality occurs for many reasons, but it's quite common in wind pollinated plants. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, uh, it's, sec it's secondary, but it really shows that there was probably a very strong association between bisexuality and uh, animal pollination, which has, which seems to have been a good idea for flowering plants. Mm -hmm. and, and it was probably self-compatible, right? Do you think? Yeah, very likely. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's uh, another issue that would be interesting to to reconstruct is all the self incompatibility, right? Yes. Across that, the that, yeah, that's a whole other yeah. A lot of people are thinking about it. Yeah. Um, obviously, it wasn't like perfectly self uh, compatible and self fertilizing. Otherwise you just wouldn't have survived very or diversified much, right? Mm -hmm. So it was probably a combination of both. Uh, how, how it put a break on that, it's uncertain. Uh, there's a lot of, I always get confused between decogamy and hercogamy, but bas basically I think uh, it, it might have been protogynous because that occurs so much, but mm -hmm. But uh, maybe it was also incompletely, um, uh, incomplete. it was not avoiding entirely self-fertilization because that's also a really good idea. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I invite you guys to read, uh, on, that, on that note, there's an incredible paper that uh, was published a couple of months ago in Current Biology about the relationship between cleistogamy and zygomorphy mm. by Simon Joly and Dan Schoen. And they show that... Mm -hmm. uh, Darwin suggested that a while back, but they, they sort of demonstrated it with uh, comparative methods that uh, cleistogamy, so completely closed flowers that coexist mm -hmm. with open flowers, mm -hmm. um, that occurs more in hyper-specialized uh, systems 
and that that is the definition of zygomorphy. That there's mm. more histogamy occurs more in zygomorphy as a sort of way to uh, self fertilize when mm. the structure of the flower uh, prevents that. Mm. So what was happening in the early angiosperms? Who knows? But it, it was probably not entirely outcrossing and not entirely self fertilizing. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting, all these things. Um, let me see. Uh, Paulina Cruz is the next question. Thank you very much for the talk. My question is, if the hypothesis of the Jurassic gap has an effect on the construction of the ancestral flower. Oh, um, so thank you for that question. Um, so if, if I rephrase the question is because we don't know the edge of the angiosperms, how does this uh, uncertainty affect our reconstructions? So when, when we conducted our analysis on either, uh, on both trees that had angiosperms constrained at 140 million years and others at 220, 250 million years, we found exactly the same results. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was first shocked by how little impact uh, that big question had on that other big question we were trying to answer. Uh, but then uh, thinking about it, it actually kind of makes sense because these two trees, they're just, one is stretched compared to the other. The time is taken into account in both cases is the same data, the same phylogeny. And just the fact that there's been more time proportionally over the entire flowering plant phylogeny doesn't really affect what we can reconstruct. Mm -hmm. I assume it would have a major effect if we had odd groups that we could score, but unfortunately flowers hardly mm -hmm. exist outside of flowering plants. So the mm -hmm. fact that we in older hypothesis for the origin of flowering plants, the time between their seed, uh, their stem node and their crown node is much smaller. And that would have an impact if the stem node was important. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, we don't have data. We, we, we could potentially score the sex in the presence of a perianth, but that's, that's about it. There's no equivalent for stamens, for carpels, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, now uh, we move on, I think, to the last question. And this is Martin Hesahim uh, de Santiago, who's uh, also one of our graduate students. Thank you so much for the talk. It's very interesting. What do you think about the evolution of correlations between floral traits and the evolution of angiosperms from early to present species? A correlation between uh, the traits on one hand and the angiosperms on the other, is that? Or I guess I guess he's thinking about trait correlations and how you know how um, these right. different floral traits do not evolve independently but evolve. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's it's a difficult question because um, on the one hand we we're almost certain that traits are not evolving independently, uh, especially in the flower, that there's a very strong correlations. Uh, but on the other, uh, these correlations are very difficult to take into account um, with the current methods that we have. Um, so that was one question from one reviewer of the paper. And our solution to that, if you look up that paper, you'll see uh, there's a figure or a table that answers that question. So we can't, we don't have any um, comparative methods that allow us to take, um, to analyze correlations among many discrete traits together in the phylogeny. We can do two or three traits together, but then we just go into crazy matrices with uh, horrible parameter space. Mm. So, and that's very different from the continuous traits where there's a lot of multivariate statistics that allow us to do that. So for the discrete traits that we had, because we couldn't do that, what we did is we looked at all of the pairwise uh, correlations. So we looked at all of the possible combinations of two traits within our 20 or so traits. So that was more than a 200 possible pairwise correlations. And we looked using comparative methods, both likelihood and Bayesian, 
uh, whether or not we could detect a signal in correlation. So these are all for those who, who know that literature is all derived from the original Pagel 1994 paper, which was looking at correlations among two traits. And then we looked at the impact of these, taking these, two, these correlations into account on our results. And we found two things. One was that correlation was everywhere. We found that more than 50% of the, the pairs were correlated. So there was an enormous signal for uh, floral integration, which a lot of people had proposed for a very long time, but it was sort of like a massive confirmation of that, which really suggests that a lot of traits are co-evolving. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the interesting second conclusion was that we were getting the same overall results. So say mm -hmm. if you took like uh, bisexual flowers, so say bisexual and zygomorphy, bisexual infusion, bisexual and number of carpels, etc., we would find in that case, probably 99% of the cases that while taking the correlation into account, we mm -hmm. reconstruct a combination of states that are saying the, the ancestral flower was bisexual. And so that, that gave us a form of reassurance that um, were we able to uh, take properly all of those correlations into account, it is possible that our results would still be robust. We don't have the final answers, but the pairwise correlations are giving us a hint that perhaps uh, our results are robust to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one too. Well, I think I don't see any more questions. Um, okay, Jacob says there's no more questions. So I guess that would be it. Thank you very much. No, no problems. Thank you so much for uh, listening and for all those questions. This was a really good experience. And don't hesitate to contact me if you have any other things you want to discuss. Yeah, thank you very much. It was it was a great talk.